even though color work is something that scared me. I was like, I can control this. Everything else in my life is completely out of control. I can't control what his blood numbers are doing. I can't control his oxygen level. I can't control anything. You know what I can control? These sticks and this string. And by God, (laughs) he's going to get this sweater. All right, here we are. Uh, my name is Johnny Vasquez. I am the founder and head honcho at Yarnist Media, and I am joined by my good friend, Margaret Weinert Lishner. I always have such trouble. I know it's a lot of it's a lot of syllables. It's a lot of syllables. But yeah, Margaret Weinert Lishner, not happy to be here. And uh, we are the hosts of the Yarn Talk podcast. Is that what we're going to call it? Like, I I suppose you know what if if it changes, then it changes. That's okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. I did a bunch of research to be like, okay, does anybody use the Yarn Talk podcast? And I couldn't even find that somebody used to use that name. Well, and it, but I, I didn't mean, also want to be like Yarnist. I, I Podcast, would say it's or... it's accurate to what we're talking about, though, is a lot Absolutely. of yarn stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But we should also say that we focus primarily on knitting. So if you're a crocheter that's joining us, sometimes what we're talking about might be interesting. And mm-hmm. half of the time, it's probably not going to be relatable. But no discrimination. We like crochet, too. Both of us yeah. are also crocheters. That is true. We both do crochet. I think that it's a useful tool to have in the tool chest absolutely and i think some things you can only do with crochet exactly and i think that there are things that crochet is at is better at than than knitting for certain applications i just i know i've been consistently knitting for longer we'll put it that way because i did actually learn to crochet first Uh, and we will get into that because on today's episode we're We're just being selfish and talking about us uh so so we are the guests uh that won't be the case in the future we will be bringing on other people that are doing interesting things in the yarn world uh but we thought that to kick things off you'd like to get to know us better because you might be familiar with me from whatever you what however you found this um But you're probably not familiar with Margaret. And uh, Margaret and I have been working together on and off for quite a while now. Since 2014. Isn't that that long? Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's totally wild. So, um, yeah. So what we're going to do, the format of today's episode is uh, we are just going to interview each other. We have kind of like a series of questions. We're going to ask the question. Each of us is going to give our answer and then, you know, we'll keep moving on accordingly. (laughs) Okay. So, um, Margaret, let's start with you. Um, Why don't you give just a a little brief sort of like tell us about yourself. Uh, You don't need to go so much into your history, but like, who are you? Where are you? Why are you? Why am I? That's deep. Um, I'm Margaret. Right now, I'm living in Wilmington, North Carolina in the United States. Um, My husband and I met doing theater in college. So we've been all over the place teaching theater, doing theater, being theater nerds. Um, So now he's he's teaching at a local university. And um, I have a five-year-old son who's just awesome sauce named Isaac. Uh, I have been knitting and doing fiber arts related things since I was about seven years old. So uh, it's been a hot minute. Um, But yeah, that was, that's been a real consistent through my life is, has always been, I mean, I was that weird kid in college. You had a, a more yarn than clothes in my dorm room. It was, you know, big bins under the bed and everyone thought I was crazy. But who's crazy now? <laughs> um, I'm also crazy. There we go. Uh, that's why I am. Um, main hobbies are 
knitting, crocheting, sewing, bizarre fibery embroidery, bizarre fibery stuff, and uh, pretty much watching as as much TV and movies as I possibly can. I'm definitely a film nerd, so those are those are my big loves, and you know that five year old, he's pretty cool. <laughs> How about you, Johnny? Introduce uh, well, yourself to the people. Yeah, obviously. so so some people may be familiar with me uh, from my YouTube channel, uh, which started out as News Today, and uh, and my website. Um, but the, but if I go way back, um, I I grew up in uh, in West Covina uh California, California just exactly just outside of Los Angeles maybe Los Angeles proper still in Los Angeles County um and Margaret was singing a song from the show uh, uh crazy, Ex- crazy Ex- Girlfriend. Girlfriend, um which was on the CW for like three seasons and when when that four seasons four seasons it's one of my favorite shows <laughs> um as soon as it hit, it, it, they previewed the show with the song. The opening number for the whole show is a musical number about my hometown. And I walked into the office and I was like, everybody stop what you're doing. You have to see this. And they're kind of like, okay, but what's the big deal? And I'm like, they made a musical about my dinky little city. And, and it's kind of like a joke in the first few episodes that she leaves New York to go move to West Covina. Um, it's spectacular. It's <laughs> it's, a, it's a pretty funny show. Um, I could I couldn't get past some of the humor after the first few episodes. I didn't follow follow it, but um, it's not everyone's cup of tea. But I absolutely adore it. And what's funny is I'd actually known Rachel Bloom, the creator, her stuff from college. I was watching her YouTube videos back in the day, hmm. and then I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, it's her. She wrote a insane song about Ray, about Ray Bradbury. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so both Margaret and I are also big musical theater nerds. Um, and you turned me on to, uh, to Hamilton b- before yes. it was huge, yes. uh, really, like really early on. So, um, and it took, I listened to it like three times before I finally got what was going on, but I was like, okay, like super into this. Yeah, and now the rest of the world, is, you know, like actually worth the time. Well. Yeah, yeah. They're just riding so, our coattails. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I I grew up uh, in Southern California. Knitting is not like a huge thing there because it's hot, and so like you don't need sw- like all of our sweaters are made out of cotton. Um, well, actually, before I get into that, I probably should like say uh, like now I live in Estonia, um, in in Tallinn, Estonia. Which for those of you who are very bad at geography, like I was. Um, it is the the northern eastern most European country on the main continent of Europe. It's cold. Yeah. Although I think technically Finland is actually connected to the European continent. So maybe you, you can say eh. what that is. Um, Finland's mostly connected to Russia. Yeah, but that part of Russia is still considered Europe. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For now, uh, exactly. <laughs> I'm just saying in the history of of Russian geography, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, We're not even talking politics. We're just talking geography here. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we. I remember having some discussion that like, are Russians European or Asian? And the answer is yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Who knows yes, exactly. which so, one? Um, and the story of how I got here, we could probably go into later, but I, I live here now, uh, with my wife and I have five children, but I have, uh, uh, a girl, uh, another girl, boy and twin girls. So Yay! I've only gotten uh, to meet the oldest two in person. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and the last, yeah. the, and the last time uh, their second was a, a little bitty baby. So it's yeah. been a hot second. For sure, for sure. Um, so as far as how I got into the fiber arts world, um, you know, my grandma uh, on my mom's side was always crocheting. Like we always had like handmade blankets. She would always do these like cross stitch 
ornaments you know they have those like sort of like a plastic um frames yeah. that you can like stitch onto so she would make ornaments for us every year using those she did do some knitting but she was mostly she sat watching her novellas and just crocheting you know and and she crocheted so fast that, uh, that it was it was insane but I, it wasn't appealing to me because she, what she would do is she would walk around with a little uh formula on a piece of paper that told her how much yarn she needed in each color to make her afghan pattern was it an and index she, card because that's exactly what my grandmother would do i actually never saw it so oh, I, I was no. just told that that's how she did i it. have some of my grandma's index cards because my question was always like why do the colors and the yarn always suck so bad and it's because <laughs> she would just buy what was ever on sale so it didn't need to look nice or at least it looked nice in her her mind you know nice. but like the last time that oh, what taste. she was making was cool was like 20 or 30 years earlier so um and she would just use you know the cheap you know acrylic red heart the yarn. scratchy acrylic yeah 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 which so which was fine for afghans but not for anything else so um and then on my dad's side my great-grandmother was really into fiber arts. So I heard stories about like how she would stop them on the side of the road and go like pick a bunch of like flowers that were, you know, off in the divider on the freeway, you know, um, and use them. She would take them and go like make dye out of it and dye her own That's wool. That's treacherous. Yeah, yeah. My and then goodness, she would, um, hardcore. And she was really into weaving. And so they had like a big loom um and they had like a spinning wheel and and stuff like that so i i mean i only met her a couple of times that i remember when she was doing that um and because i was super young like four or five you know like um but when i got into the fiber arts my dad's told me more stories about that i think that they um even have uh a weaving of her dog's hair so she like collected the dog hair, spun it into yarn and wove story. it into a tapestry. Yeah. So, mm. so she was like really into the fiber arts. And my, my other grandma was, I guess, a, a, a pretty good seamstress. She would like go, you know, rather than buy the new dresses, she would just go and stand in front of the department stores and sketch mm. out the designs like, yeah, and then go home that. and make it. Yeah. No, I've never seen my grandma do any work ever. Like she didn't, <laughs> she didn't cook. She didn't, she was basically like, look, I raised my kids. I did my I'm job. Done. Yeah. So like, like the most that we got like growing up was like, uh, you know, peanut butter, jelly sandwiches and, hey, you know, you a cup of the milk groups there. You got peanut butter, you got jelly, you got bread. You're fine. Or, or a can of chili. Like that was her like favorite things to eat. Um, and I love me myself, some, some Denison's chili, but yeah, that was the extent of her cooking. Like, so I was shocked to find out that she could like make clothing. Um, yeah, it is kind of a magical power. Yeah. So, so that's sort of like the, the history of fiber arts in my family, you know, like my mom didn't really do a lot of stuff when I was more like younger, she did some sewing and stuff like that, but I, I never seen her knit or anything. Like that. So how do I end up like being a professional knitting teacher and designer? Uh, I was, I'll do the short version of the story, which is that I was following a uh, Kickstarter campaign called the fiber shed, which is started by a woman named Rebecca Burgess. She's got an amazing story. She she has a book. She's got a whole organization that she runs now. But at the time, she was just getting all that started. But the concept was she was going to make all of her clothing from within 150 miles of her home. That's intense. <clears throat> yeah. And so she was sourcing everything and having it made and designed and constructed in that geographic area. And the idea was to be more connected to your clothing. And so I was like, that sounds like a cool idea. I'd like to be more connected to my clothing. And then one day she did a, a, a blog post about a hat that she had made. And she just told the story about how she got the wool, how she got it milled, and how she had this person design it. 
And I was like, you know what? That hat doesn't suck. Like, it doesn't look <laughs> like the stuff it's that my grandma miracle. normally made. I was like, knitting can look cool? Okay. Like, that's interesting. I'm interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, you know, I don't want to, like, I think making a shirt would be not, like, so easy, but easy enough that, like, I could probably do it in an afternoon. And I wanted something a little bit more challenging than that. I wanted something that I would use often. Uh, so I was like, well, jeans would be great because I'd wear jeans all the time, but you need special equipment. To yeah, jeans are a pain. Jeans. And you need to actually have skill. Um, <laughs> not that you don't have to have skill to sew other things, but you know, to show no, sew a t shirt's not that challenging. It it has unique challenges with a pair of jeans. Yeah. So I was like, okay, that's that's not it. I didn't wasn't interested in having like hand knit socks. I didn't think I would wear those in um, southern california not as much yeah and so i was like i think i will knit a sweater so i told i just got married uh in may this is july of 2010 so i tell my wife i think i'm gonna knit a sweater and she was like well you should probably learn to knit and I was like, that's good that's a good point so so i went a to big deal I went to Walmart and I got a, a teach yourself to knit kit and two skeins of purple, simply soft, like, like eggplant, simply soft. And I took the kit home and started reading through the book, threw the book away because it didn't make any sense at all. And I went on YouTube and found some tutorials to like teach me how to, because, you know, I was flabbergasted. How do you get the yarn on the needle? Like, how do you get it to stay on the needle? Magic is the answer. It, it, yeah. Obviously, like you learned it. your incantations and your cure yeah, yeah. Um, But, you know, when you start out, you only have to sacrifice small animals to get what you want. So. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> this is the direction we're going in this podcast. <laughs> so. um so I, so I, I followed the YouTube videos and I, you know, started picking up pretty quickly, you know, and I was like, all right, it's pretty cool. Like, it's kind of like relaxing and like interesting. And I think especially for, for men, um, there is a, not all men, I don't know, but you know, uh, there is a desire to build things to create. And so I think that there is something in knitting where the act of constructing the fabric that like the build the fabric row by row, stitch by stitch, and to architect that into the shapes that you need in order to make something wearable is very satisfying. I, th I think it is one of the reasons why so many of the historically top designers have been men. Uh, because they have this inner kind of like need or desire to create like that. Um, I'm not saying that women don't have that need or desire themselves, but it's just different. So I found a satisfaction in knitting that I hadn't had in, or, or that only related to other things that I had done, like, you know, making props and costumes for like, stuff in theater when I was in high school. I think there's a, it's, it's really nice to have a, so a lot of time when we say creative outlet, it's a, a lot of people think, you know, something visual arts only, you know, mm -hmm. painting or music or something like that. But when you're actually, when you're, we're talking about actually creating something from the ground up and it's, you know, when you get really into cooking something very specific and you're like this freaking rocks this is so cool I can tell where each flavor is playing off each other and I feel like it's the same thing with knitting that you do get to just create you know, like I make my own chicken broth for example I make my own broths of all kinds and I'm like this is incredible because I am making some something delicious out of garbage like no everyone would think to throw all those celery pieces and onion skins away but if you boil them for a couple hours you get incredible flavor goo and like that's exactly <laughs> what so I think that's it yeah it's this uh this idea that you get to really create something that's truly yours and that's awesome 
there's like no better feeling. That's amazing. <laughs> okay. I want to take a break real quick from our conversation, but we'll get back to that in just a minute. But I want to tell you about The Yarnist, which is our daily knitting email magazine, which comes out every Monday through Friday. In it, you're going to get a quick little article to help you learn about knitting and think about it in ways that maybe you haven't already. Sometimes we have articles about different kinds of yarns, like why wool is so important as a yarn material itself. We talk about things like different ways that you can use stitch markers or the importance of Elizabeth Zimmerman and her effect on knitting in America. You're also going to get an inspirational quote, a pattern of the day. We do uh, our signature stitch tutorial where you get a video on how to do a different stitch technique or knitting pattern. And we always try to end each issue with a comic or something to make you laugh. Now, the best part is that this daily knitting magazine is completely free. All you have to do to get yours is go to yarnist.co and enter your email to sign up today and you'll start getting it right away. All right, let's get back to our conversation. Absolutely. So I think that that's where knitting connected with me. Um, and then how I started doing what I was doing is I was trying to knit a pattern by Bruce Weinstein, um, who we will have an interview with in a future episode. Uh, and, and it was both an extremely complicated uh, project and also ex incredibly simple because it uses a stitch called the horizontal herringbone, which oh in gosh. the written... yeah in the written instructions makes zero sense at all. Uh, and I was like, what the hell is going on here? And it, I was, I remember I went to a, a yarn store in Vermont. Uh, I think it was. And I was trying to explain to this woman, like, okay, I don't know how this works. Can you tell me like, am I just stupid or is it like poorly explained, you know? And I, uh, and she was like, just trust. <laughs> well, we kind of worked it out, but eventually I found a really poorly filmed video on YouTube that demonstrated the thing, but it was almost impossible to make out what was going on. Oh. So it was like really like low quality, like it was a small video. And, and I was like, what the heck? Like, we have the technology, like I can literally make a better video with my iPhone. And the iPhone that I had at the time was the iPhone 4S, I think. Um, so we're talking oh, like not, literally like not fancy. Yeah. Two and a half generations, like from the beginning. Um, and so I got a stitch dictionary for Christmas. And I had also been at a yarn store in Chicago. I was traveling like around the country uh, for, for work. So that's why I was in all these different places. When I was in Chicago, there was an off-duty police woman who, no, no, she was on duty. She was at the yarn store. And Even she was better. On duty. Yeah. <laughs> and she was sitting there. I was chatting with her, you know, just about knitting. And we had, she, there was one of those perpetual knitting calendars, knitting stitch calendars on the table. Mm -hmm. And she was like, you know, it'd be a really great idea is to take this, do, like actually knit one of these stitches every day. And then at the end of the year, make it all into a blanket. And I was like, that is a great idea. Like, and then the last piece is I was following this blog called new dress a day where this woman had lost her job. And as a, something to just keep her sanity, uh, she was like, okay, I'm going to make a new piece of clothing every day. Like, so she would go to the thrift store and buy, uh, you could buy clothes by the pound. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and most of the stuff that was in this one bin was like these like giant muumuu dresses, you know. The kind um, that populate every thrift store ever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And she would love to get them because usually they they sometimes they had like a nice print on them and it was a ton of fabric. And so that's why she liked to to buy those and she would make these cute little outfits every day. It wasn't always a dress. Sometimes it was just like a blouse or something like that. Um and I was like, "What a great 
like kind of goal blog, you know, like it, she was just trying to do it for a year. She ended up doing it for a few years and I think she got like a book deal out of it or something like that. Um, nice. So, so I was like, okay, what if I made video tutorials of the stitch patterns in the books every day and use that as a way for me to get better at knitting and also offer some like better support education to people out there. And the, the videos are not great. My first videos like are not great in the, in the sense that they have heart, sir. <laughs> well, I just didn't have the equipment, you know, like exactly. literally the first video is filmed in a days in, in Binghamton, New York. The probably backdrop- stayed at that same big, Binghamton days in <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. Um, <laughs> it, the backdrop is just the pillowcase from the the bed. And I bought like two work lights from Home Depot and just clamped them to the desk. And then there wasn't any like, you know, like there were hardly any smartphones and nobody was doing like iPhoneography or stuff like that really. Um, So there wasn't like, you know, camp, like now we have these, you know, every tripod comes with one of these, you know, little mounts uh, that can fit any phone, but those just didn't exist. So, um, so So after holding over someone's head, (laughs) no, so literally it's my wife holding the phone. Oh no, I was joking. That's incredible. Yeah. So you'll see the videos like kind of like moving all over the place as I'm trying to do it. And her hands are getting like all tired. She's like, are you done yet? You know, can you, and I think it's just the, the, like a slip knot that I'm trying to explain. Um, you're like, I need to do it three more times. Calm down. (laughs) Um, so yeah, things have come a a long way since then, but that, that's kind of how I got into doing what I'm doing now is I, started making videos as oh and i started my website new stitch a day instead of new dress a day um as a way to document yeah just document share yeah along the way so that's awesome i don't think i knew known all the i've known many of the components of that story but i don't think i've had them all put together before i don't know and that's just the (laughs) someone asked this question Someone asked how I end up in Estonia uh, on a like a Q&A chat that I did with our community. Like, and, how does anyone end up in Estonia? <laughs> right. <laughs> I was like, look, we have time. So I'm going to go back to the very beginning. And it took me an hour to oh explain gosh. all of the things that like led up to me moving to Estonia. I don't. Yeah, when I've tried to explain to people all the different ways I've moved across the world and this country, everyone's like, I don't, that's not linear though. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. It's not. It's just weird is mostly what it is. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So um, you mentioned that you've been knitting since you were very young. Yes. How did you learn and sort of like maybe like what was like the first project that you ever made um so I don't exact I think there was a children's book that I had when I was very small I think my son actually has it I'll pull it out at some future time and it's about all of the steps that a little girl in somewhere in central Europe right around World War I, World War II, has to go through to get a coat. So it's like, you know, they this family has no money. The rest of the people in the community have no money. So here's what we're going to barter to the farmer to get the wool from the sheep. Here's what we're going to barter to the person who's going to spin the wool. All these different things. And I loved this book. I think it's called A Coat for Anna. It was on Reading Rainbow. Um, when I was seven years old, my mother decided to homeschool my family, my older brother, my younger sister, and me. And they 
did it in kind of a fun way that they sat us all down and said, okay, we're going to be homeschooling. What is it that you want to learn? And I was like, I want to learn to knit. Absolutely. That is what I want to do. And my mom had had sort of a fraught relationship with knitting for a long time. And I, I think she had a, she had a Finnish friend who, this is foreshadowing. She had a Finnish friend who was staying with their family in high school, who was an excellent knitter, just would knit without patterns, incredibly talented. And um, so my mom was kind of trying to work with stuff along with Pivy and it was not she said, I was working on this navy blue sweater that just would not end. I was stock a net forever. And I thought this is way too much. And then I think the only other time that she had actually decided to have uh, a project that she wanted to work on was when she was pregnant with my older brother. And it's this green sweater with a gray grumpy cat on the front. So all in intarsia. And she said, you know, doing that in Tarja just about killed me. It wasn't, that sweater wasn't done until she had had my younger sister. So that is over six years that she was working on this one sweater. And there's supposed to be a matching sweater for a little kid. And my mom had turned to one of her friends and said, you know, I don't, I don't know what to do. I want the yeah, I want to have the small sweater, but I just can't handle doing that intarsia again. And the friend said, oh, I will totally do the intarsia. That's the fun part for me. You just do the back and the sleeves. So together they were able to make this child sweater way faster. But my mom was like, that's it. We're not knitting anymore. That's too much. So uh, when I'm seven and I say, <laughs> I really want to learn to knit, she's like, oh, crap. That's the one thing I don't want to teach you. Um, and so she said, you know what? Let's crochet instead because you really only have to handle one or two loops on the hook at a time. And therefore, we don't have to worry about you dropping stitches. And I very dutifully learned to crochet and I absolutely despised it at the time. I've come around since then, but I was so angry that I did not get to learn the thing I wanted to learn. Our Finnish friend, Paivi, was actually visiting our family right when this was happening, which my mom hadn't seen her in over a decade. And all of a sudden she's in our house and she's making some incredible cabled sweater. I was hanging off her arm, just trying to watch and learn And Pivy thought we were nuts for homeschooling anyway. And she just says, you know, if you really believed in this child-led learning thing, you would teach her how to knit because uh, then she would be the first one to decide if it was too hard for her. And my mom's like, oh, well, duh. That's very annoying that she's right. (laughs) And so she sat down and cast on, like, I didn't know how to cast on right away because she cast on for me. But I do know that I woke Pivy up like four times early, early in the morning to pick up my dropped stitches. Cause I was, so, I think I made a bookmark. So it was a little garter stitch square and I was going to, I had a whole business plan. I was going to sell them by the side of the road. This was like, this was going to be my big break. And my mom's like this, this girl's nuts. And then I said, Hey mom, where does yarn come from? And ever since then, my whole family has been off to the race. I cannot count how many spinning wheels my mother has. Like we went and adopted a sheep. Um, that someone else kept, but we got to keep the fleece. Like it has been all fiber all the time. I think if you went down into my parents' basement, you would drown in fiber (laughs) because my mom teaches felting now. She teaches spinning. She does all this other stuff. So she's come around to the whole, that I think it was learning to knit socks was really the turning point for my mother. Sometimes when she saw, she's like, okay, I didn't, one of the things that I found very difficult for a long time was reading because I was just bored by the books that they were giving me to read. I did not have any interest in watching Spot Run. That was not fun for me. And my mom took a little bit of a stretch and she got me Beezus and Ramona by Beverly Cleary. And then I read the whole last chapter out loud. Like you just need to find the thing that hooks you. Um, and for my mom, it was learning to turn a heel, doing short rows. She was like, oh my gosh, this is actually magical. I'm going to do that. And she still makes incredible architectural socks all the time. She's probably going to watch this. Hi, mom. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's been, I, that was really sort of the catalyst for that. But I would take a lot of other educational components and sort of link them together with knitting and history and knitting and science, all these other things. Um, 
yeah, that's been, I, I'm also a huge uh, history buff. So that's been a really fun thing for me to get to, into costume design and other things like that through theater. Um, I don't know what, what other, you had another part of this question, but I don't remember. I just you said, already I, answered it, which was uh, what was the first thing that you made? Oh, uh, yeah, a but bookmark. a bookmark. But I think probably one of the things that I'm most proud of, I had, I don't even know how I got my hands on the wool, but I made the, I spun the yarn, it was black sheep's wool, um, horribly lumpy. I did a really not good, I would think I was nine or so nine between nine and 11. So I made this black sheep's wool yarn um, into a hat with a reverse stockinette stitch ridge at the, there was also like a little twizzle at the top, but along that, so the whole hat's black sheep's wool. And then right along that ridge, I'd spun collie fur, like from a dog into that. So I had like little fuzzy fur, um stripes in it and I was like this and I said that I entered it into a competition and I was like oh well I'm looking at all of these beautifully hand spun and knit things and I was like yeah well that's not this is what a lovely bit of time that I wasted but it's okay I still enjoy this hat it was also massive I had no idea how gauge worked and uh then I ended up winning a prize for it I was like well that's that's interesting that you know even even though I would have said that this was not worth anyone's time, they think it's actually cool. And that was nice to be able to say, oh, you know, maybe not. Maybe the things that I create and bring me joy aren't garbage. That's fun. <laughs> but yeah, that's probably one of the more uh, intense pro- was this black sheep's wool with collie fur trim. Because I don't even know what possessed me, but it needed to happen. It needed to come out into the world. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you made a really great point about how uh, finding the like right the thing that hooks you into knitting, particularly, um, is really a lot like the thing that helps you fall in love with reading. Absolutely, because I think a lot of people think there's only one path to finding these things, and there's there's no one path for anything. I just don't think that there, there is. Like I, you know, the thing that got me wanting to, to knit was knitting a sweater. I have knit a few sweaters. Um, and I actually, uh, I'm going to be working on a few in the near future and I feel much more confident now working on those, but it's because I have become better at other things in knitting where those things just don't intimidate me in the way that they did before. And I have the skills now to troubleshoot issues along the way in, in a very natural way. Absolutely. I feel like the, the thing that's hardest for people when they're starting is not being able to read what they've already made mm-hmm. to figure out what the, what the problem point is. Cause then once you can do that, you can just relax you, you don't have to have a panic attack every time you drop a stitch because you're like, oh, well, but I know how if I was there, I would get it up here. So we'll, mm-hmm. I take you mean like actually reading because you can read the stitches. Like, exactly. What, basically, kn- knitting is a form of language. Like, it's not too far away from what I would say is like a computing language, something that's like very exactly. basic. Um, a binary but- code. I don't think it's a binary code, but it's close. There, it's true. There are variations when you get increases, decreases. But, but let's say that the like that. let's say that the the language itself is maybe only less than ten characters. Uh, yes. I think probably closer to like five or six characters, with some some variations on those things. Fun like you weaving. might put like a tilde on top of. <laughs> Exactly. (laughs) Fun weaving fact. uh, The first versions of computer cards that people made were actually for looms. They were for creating color work jacquard fabrics. That totally makes sense. Yeah. Because they still use those uh, even in knitting machines today. But so the back in the 1700s, it was 
is it up or is it down? Those are the two things mm-hmm. that you can do. And that's how you'd cr- come up with these incredible brocades. And I just think that's the the coolest thing that you're like, oh, well, where did we get this idea that you could have a card that stores all this information out of fiber arts? And that's amazing. That's amazing. That is a that's super amazing. cool, super cool knit fact. I'm so uh, full of, of trivia fiber facts. facts. Fiber facts. Fiber uh, fact. <laughs> so <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough, uh, I don't even know how this ends up being the case, but I'll be right back. I wait with bated breath. This was laying on the floor, uh, which is the very first knitting project that I ever finished. Oh, so it's not the first project that I worked on. I actually had a sampler scarf where I was experimenting with a bunch of stitches that I made out of that eggplant yarn, but that got left out of school in like Minnesota or something like that um, on accident. It wasn't good at all. They so never I, are, but that's no love okay. lost over that being gone. Um, but this one, my kids still wear. It's in their dress up bin oh, and it's that's uses. So sweet. It's all knits and pearls that use something called a ripple stitch, um, which is just a very simple, like, you know, changing uh, from knits and pearls uh, at, at different intervals. Uh, but I just took one repeat of it and turned it into a little headband. That's and fantastic. Oh, my gosh. I love that the kids are still playing with it. I think my ex-boyfriend, Matt, who we're I'm still friends with, um, he gave me his first scarf that was like and it is he knows it is so ugly it is incredibly (laughs) ugly it's this like sort of sage green there's a weird rib section in there and he handed it to me and I was just touched that he gave me the first thing he'd made and he was like I just think you should know I think this is the ugliest thing that's ever been created and I was like well I'm gonna wear it (laughs) you're you can't stop me from wearing this truly awful looking object in public and it's still in my parents house somewhere we still have matt's first my parent my mom ran into him at rhinebeck a few years ago which was great because now he's an incredibly accomplished knitter um and it's just funny because i still have his uh his first piece of oh it's was scratchy too (laughs) not good (laughs) but that's what we do for the people we love Absolutely. I, yeah, that first Christmas we made all of our gifts, you know, we knit all of our gifts and we, you know, we were just like buying every yarn that we could find. And I was like, oh, this is cool. This is interesting. Tried out loom knitting because, you know, you can make different fabric with loom uh, than you can through actual knitting. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, there's a certain shape of a knitting loom that's kind of like a bar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's really close together and you can actually create a double knit fabric that's impossible to to do by hand Ooh, i don't think i've actually tried that one before <clears throat> um I haven't... yeah so i made like a scarf out of it or something like that you know because you can't do any much else than make like a big flat piece of fabric which i mean now that i know more i could probably do more with that but um it, they don't wear any of it like it's you know <laughs> oh, i should also say that's part of what's so frustrating so i live in um north carolina and right now it's um it's se- late september and it is still in the 90s all okay. the time it is so hot um i grew up in upstate new york so it was really nice that i got to wear all the use all of the stuff that i was knitting all the time i would bully so many friends into learning to knit with me so I was like, oh, no, I know that you don't actually want to do this, but you're going to sit down and I'm going to show you. And they're like, but why? And I said, because I've decided you need to know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, they don't wear it uh, because they they don't like to wear it, not because it's not comfortable to wear. <laughs> well, that's but just a shame. <laughs> to be fair, like I probably wouldn't wear anything that I made the, my first year of knitting either. So but it's like, about it's about now. the spirit of giving, Johnny. It's a different yeah, we, thing. <laughs> and, and you know, it helps being in a warmer climate, like we like we are. Sorry, a colder climate uh, here in Estonia, where it feels like it's just always winter. Um, that sounds like that, heaven. Honestly, I'm just too hot here. <laughs> it, 
<laughs> I was fine the first four years. And this year I'm like, okay, I don't actually know if I can deal with nine months of winter. Like, okay. That would be a bit wearing. It took so long for it to get warm this year. It was May. Oh, okay. Be- yeah. That's... Before we got anything resembling spring. And then it was just raining all the time. So, mm. and then we had like two months of summer. Which the summers here are beautiful because they don't. I've, yeah, I've seen some of the photos are absolutely stunning. And, but it doesn't get more than like 85 degrees. Like it's just don't like the weather. And even that, you know, like when you're used to it being cold all the time, that's like miserable, you know. I was going to say, don't threaten me with a good time. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Most people have trouble with the darkness. That doesn't actually bother me very much, but it's just the cold. It gets so cold. Um, but I actually wear knitted stuff now, you know, that I, that I made. And also like our friends appreciate the knitted things. One, they know how to appreciate it, but yeah, they, you know, they actually use it like making knitted goods for my parents in, in the desert of California, you know, they live like basically in Mojave and (laughs) it's like, they're, you know, they never going to... You really need a hat, do you? <laughs> like it does get cold there. It, it actually snowed the last time I was in, at their place in the in the desert. But but yeah, you know, it's, it's just, a different flavor of cold, most certainly. Yeah, it's different. So okay, so so the theme that I have shifted to uh, in the past couple of years, it it used to be like knitting made simple right i wanted to Mm -hmm. take something that feels complex to people and distill it down into the easiest possible way to consume it but my reason for doing that was that when something seems simple that once was hard then you're no longer afraid to like do that thing and so i've shifted now to this concept of being a fearless knitter i like it um and so i just got an email from someone who it was it was actually quite interesting because she was like i have heard you use this phrase you know for a while now and i have never understood why it was important to be a fearless knitter because she has always kind of just gone headlong into things without thinking about them. that's fantastic that's yeah absolutely superpower <laughs> but she finally understood that not everybody's like that and so I'm, I'm making it sound somehow like she's like uh you know full of herself but it was no. more a, a way of realizing that like oh okay there are all prop like this is not something for which I have that feeling, but there are other things in my life, which I do feel that way about. And now I get why it's important. And that's really, you know, in, in our uh, magazine every day, um, I send out a, a, a daily uh, email magazine. Okay? Mm-hmm. And I do a little article about knitting. Sometimes it's more like you know philosophical uh sometimes it's very practical um sometimes it's more like let's you know maybe you've never heard of this thing before and let's just talk about it but i always include a quote that is inspirational but it's usually geared toward like this idea of encouraging you to take chances or to take to take risks, to be fearless. Um, And it's because like the idea transcends what we're doing with knitting. Exactly. That's just a, it's a good way to approach anything new, anything that you're not, forget that you're not an expert in anything that you're just trying is good. Trying is good. Trying shouldn't be scary. <laughs> Absolutely. So 
my question to you is Sorry, what do you cold. think uh being a fearless knitter means I, I haven't like you you i don't think you've read any of the stuff that i've written on this topic so um so i'm interested in your take I just a off chance the to catch up on that um i think so, i don't know something that um an example that i would say for me is color work is something that i struggled with for a very long time because it just felt very fussy and, you know, there was a whole don't have a float last more than five stitches, but I'm like, then what if I want to do something where it's required? That's super annoying. Um, when my son was born, he showed up 10 weeks early. He was one pound, 15 ounces. He was super duper tiny. Um, so he had to stay in the NICU for an extra 10 weeks. Um, I also had just moved 10 days before he was born from North Dakota to Kentucky. So just perfect timing for everything. And uh, because the hospital was two and a half hours from my home, I didn't have a chance to really go back and forth a lot. My entire life was in boxes. Everything was shambles. It was it was terrible, Johnny. It was terrible. Um, he's five now. He's fine. Um, but I managed to find a yarn store in Nashville where we were staying and I found this sweater pattern. It was for the dude sweater from the big Lebowski. So Jeff Bridges, sweat. I think it was originally a Pendleton sweater that he's wearing. So it's very heavy and it's got a lot of color work in it. And even though color work is something that scared me, I was like, I can control this. Everything else in my life is completely out of control. I can't control what his blood numbers are doing. I can't control his oxygen level. I can't control anything. You know what I can control? These sticks and this string. And by God, <laughs> he's going to get this sweater. So that was just like, it was so soothing to say, you know, yes, it's this is a scary thing, but it is a totally doable scary thing in a world of scary things that I cannot control. And it was the most healing thing I could have possibly chosen was just having this, I would put on, I would have him like in a kangaroo situation. So he was stuffed down my shirt and I would have audiobooks on and I would make this sweater. And that was, it was the best possible thing for all of us is just giving everybody a chance to calm down. So go ahead and be fearless. Cause what's the worst that's going to happen. I have to rip it out. Oh no. Then I was exactly where I started with no sweater. And instead I ended up with a fantastic sweater that he wore for two Halloweens. Like that was great. Um, so I think that's just, I don't, I think that answers your question that I think it is, what is the worst that can happen in this bubble that I can control? Like every movement of yarn and needles that I make, it's my choice. I'm in charge of that. And if it messes up, so what? I can, I can start again. Nothing's damaged. No one is permanent. This is not tattooing. No one's permanently altered at this point. I can just do the thing I need to do and it will all end up okay. And even if it ends up a little wonky, they're still going to say, look, there's a cute baby in a sweater. Who's going to be mad at that? <laughs> and if they're mad at that, then they're a jerk and you don't need them in your life. <laughs> so that was maybe a little more intense than I meant to go with that question. But yeah, that was, I would say, just go ahead, do the scary thing. If the scary thing gets messed up, you're not hurting anyone. And as a result, I've actually gotten to really like doing color work and figuring out how to capture floats, like getting it so that it doesn't have to be, if you do the thing, it doesn't have to be scary anymore. It, it shrinks the monster down. I, I couldn't say it better myself. That was beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you. I try. <laughs> That's why the universe throws such chaos at me is because it's like, oh, you'll learn from this. You'll be fine. Now, this is just part of the discussion between Margaret and myself, uh, but we have the full unedited conversation for members of Yarnist Society Plus, which is uh, part of our premium community where other fearless knitters just like yourselves uh, 
can get together, support each other. And we do a lot of other cool things in there, like knit alongs, uh, you know, challenges to help you uh, test your knitting skills. Uh, it is only $1 per week to join. You pay it all at once, but it's, uh, so it's $52 for the whole year. So go to yarnist.co slash join to become a member today.